Awesome. Well, good evening, everybody. We will go ahead and get started as we have a couple of people still joining us. I'm Shannon Lindsay. I am the UCF Art Gallery Director here at University of Central Florida, and we are so excited to offer tonight's program, which is um, Build a Broadside Workshop, which coincides and supports the current Type Out Loud exhibition, which is curated by Ashley Taylor and Dr. Dory Griffin. So um, hi, Ashley and Dory. Ashley is an artist and a designer and faculty at the University of Central Florida. And Dr. Dory Griffin is a design researcher and writer and faculty at the University of Florida. And so I'm gonna pass it off to Ashley to give you a little information about the exhibition and then we will go to Dory to get into the workshop. Thank you all for being here. Hello everyone. Uh, yes, thank you for being here. Um, this is part of the amazing exhibition, uh, Type Out Loud, that I, I'm very honored to have partnered with Dory, Dr. Dory Griffin on curating an amazing show from the history, which Dory brought in her expertise, and then contemporary designers and artists that are still continuing the tradition of maybe hand setting type or utilizing type as their mode of messaging. Uh, it was a thrill to design and, and create and come up with every part of this show. And the beautiful part of it, it was kind of a collaboration also between schools. And so UCF and Dory, who uh, is a professor there at the University of Florida. Um, so we welcome Dory to our workshop today and I will pass it off for an uh, amazing, thrilling workshop that I'm really excited about. Thanks, Ashley. I am so excited too. Um, I've been collecting even more historic type specimen images for all of you to be able to use tonight. Every time I do a workshop, I spend time adding to the pool of images that are available, and we have quite a large selection of really gorgeous um, vintage typographic specimens to look at together tonight. As we get started, I would like to share with you just a few images that are going to be able to help us contextualize what it is that we are even doing together this evening. So if, um, if my Zoom luck is holding, we are all sharing and seeing my screen now. Um, so Ashley invited me to be part of this project in part because of a book that I had written about typographic specimens. Um, and I was looking at type specimens as a way of understanding the visual history of our discipline as graphic designers. And I was really excited to be able to collect um, 250 color illustrations, 318 black and white glossary illustrations, 15 different, different typographic scripts from 24 different countries. And so a specimen is a poster, although since you're familiar with the um, broadsides show that's up in the gallery, you know that another word for poster is broadside. Um, so a broadside or a book selling fonts to printers and to designers. And I was interested, again, in thinking about these very specific kinds of designed artifacts as a way of understanding our discipline. Um, Let's see. I got into this because as a little baby typography one student at 19 years of age, um, the only woman we talked about in my three typography classes was Beatrice Ward, um, who was, according to the National Portrait Gallery of London, an authority on typography. And Beatrice Ward was a typographer, a historian, a librarian, an educator, a writer. Um, and at 19, I was like, I want to be like Beatrice Ward when I grow up. So I had this moment of resonant identification with someone who I shared qualities with. Beatrice Ward is clearly a white woman, as am I. And so I felt this kind of ability 
to see myself doing something similar. And as I was writing this book, I really wanted to make sure that I did my very best to facilitate as many Beatrice Ward moments for as many different kinds of diverse humans as possible. I'm a teacher. Um, I love what I do and I love spending time in the studio with my students. And I especially love teaching typography. Um, and when I started this book project, I had been working on a slide presentation to share with my sophomore level students about the history of the type specimen poster, because unsurprisingly, we were going to design type specimen posters. And when you Google for type specimen, you get a whole bunch of images like this, which are students doing type specimen posters. And while that's kind of cool, it wasn't what I was looking for at all. I was looking for this, right? The, the history of the type specimen and all of its richness and diversity, but also with all of its limitations. It's very specific kind of form. It traveled in very specific ways. Um, and some of those were very practical ways and some of them were ways that were very exclusionary and about keeping people out of the professionalized conversations around design. So as I got this project underway, I was lucky enough to do a research residency at the RIT Carey Collection. Shout out to the amazing librarians there. Um, they have this wonderful collection of typographic materials and I was able to encounter broadsides, printer's manuals, so like how to print on a letterpress for dummies, if, if that were a book title in the 1600s, which it wasn't, but that's essentially what a printer's manual was. Foundry specimens, so the places where metal type was actually made. Um, I looked at evolving technologies, the way that technology impacts design and always has. Um, I looked at hot metal, so um, this transition from making every single tiny little typographic sort by hand to being able to produce those mechanically. I had a wonderful time with a chapter on ephemera, so little pieces of visual culture that were made to be used once or twice and then thrown away things that had a very short lifespan a chapter on phototype i'm um, looking at photographic ways of making typography and then a chapter on digital futures and how thinking about typography in the digital context opens up some really amazing ideas and possibilities around access which is something that we are going to explore together tonight. So during the process of researching this book, I had amazing opportunities to encounter um, the real thing, right? This is Jean-Baptiste Bodoni's 1771 um, specimen book full of capital letters that he had designed. Um, I heard about this in Typography 1, too, um, before I heard about Beatrice Ward, and it was really wonderful to hold this book in my hands. Um, saw lots of images of how typography was made historically in Western Europe. And again, that's a huge part of our typographic history as a discipline, but it's not the only part of our history as a discipline. Humans are very diverse, and the ways that we have communicated visually and produced books and texts are also beautifully diverse. Um, so we're looking here at the painter, the woodcutter, and the printer. Um, book printing in Japan, which is a very different process than book printing in Western Europe has been historically. Um, but the the book production industry in Japan is and always has been very successful, even though it's a different model. 
We're looking at 16 line Maruba tag Hebrew type. So that's talking about the size, the height of the letters, and also their style. These are from the Carey collection, um, and they were important around the turn of the century in New York because there was such a huge Jewish and Yiddish immigrant population in New York that being able to print newspapers, which is what this type was used for, um, in Hebrew or in Yiddish, which uses the Hebrew alphabet, was critically important for communities to be able to circulate news and um, communicate and express themselves typographically. Thank you so much, Ashley, for that link to the Carry Collection. I got so excited, I forgot to put it in the chat. Um, and then finally, on the far right from the Monotype Book of Success from 1910, we're looking at African-American men, um, quite literally African-American men that have moved northward after the end of um, institutionalized chattel slavery in the United States, and they're working in the monotype plant. And then on the bottom, women who are typists at the monotype plant. Um, so thinking about ways that this story about Jean-Baptiste Bodoni and people who look quite a lot like him is part of our story and part of our history, but it's only one part and there are many other parts. So as I put together this book, I was really interested again in showing as many images as possible because designers, I think, tend to learn best from images um, and thinking about how including as many voices as possible in our story of what it means to be a designer or to be a typographer is valuable. It doesn't reduce the value of our story. It makes the value of our story so much more and increases our impact in the world around us. This really enriches our design practice because we can understand um, the diversity of our practice and understand that design does and always has responded to people and to context. And we can see examples of that playing out in the history of typography. Um, I think this approach also invites and welcomes folks, right? Um, this is a wonderful automated reply from a Hebrew type foundry. Um, and I just loved receiving this email that I couldn't read um, because it spoke to me about how many different kinds of audiences design has. And it's a wonderful thing to know that I am not the only audience. Um, and this allows us to tell pluralistic stories. And I think it's so important to understand that about design as a practice and a discipline. Um, this is an image um, from the cover of a linotype advertising specimen reviving a famous ancient language. Um, and I felt really passionately, especially as I was pulling together the visual glossary entries, that each, each image needs to tell a story. And for the glossary images, that's usually a story about somebody who's felt excluded by design as it's been traditionally practiced. And there are 318 of these moments of mostly historical exclusion. That's a lot of stories that are available for us to explore and learn about um, and uncover the details of. And I think that's amazingly exciting. These are just a few more images because I can't resist the images. Um, and I hope you will check the book out from your local university library at some point or even order a copy. Um, I worked really hard and it was really important to me um, that the book for an academic text is not particularly expensive, under $30. Um, so now it's your turn to get to work, not just thinking about type specimens as this historical format that's using typography 
as a method of selling more type. Um, but to think about typography, even historical materials in typography, as something that can be part of telling your story. So here's the plan. I'm going to show you a couple of example images, and then I am going to switch my screen over to the Miro board that I have set up for us to use together. If you've never used Miro, it's an online collaboration tool, and the learning curve is really, really tiny. It's not difficult at all. Um, so first I'm going to show you through Miro really quickly and show you the things you need to know. We're going to have a little bit of time to sort of play around with Miro and then introduce ourselves to each other in smallish groups. And then we're going to get to work making our typographic specimens. So a couple of sample images. Our inspiration for this project is this booklet, which is called Announcing Linotypes Specimen Book of Type Styles 1915. And so I kind of like to think of this activity as announcing our own design philosophies using material that was published around this time when this essentially birth announcement for a typographic specimen went out into the world. So one of the first things you encounter when you open this specimen is this statement about how the book itself weighs 12 pounds and it's over a thousand pages and printing it required 500 pounds of ink. And so Linotype's philosophy, as it were, its announcement is we're really impressive Look at the giantness of our specimen. The other thing to think about in relationship to a specimen as a model for what we're doing is that specimen books are full of type. And sometimes they are showing us copies or scale models of famous typographic work of the time, um, book covers that might have been very famous, posters that were very famous, um, in a way a little bit like the AIGA 50 books, 50 covers sort of concept. But the other thing that was going on was that printers in the composing room where they built the type, literally composed the type, were working with what was essentially left Overs from all of their commercial jobs. So they were printing lost dog posters and newspapers and whatever else they were printing so that they could get paid. And then they had type left over that they were composing these specimen pages out of. So they were working with the leftovers and being inventive or poetic or funny or silly or sarcastic or sometimes reflective um, in the way that they were composing these texts that they were using to advertise their fonts. I really like the idea of a novel time clock, for instance. So our design goal tonight is to use the format of the specimen broadside to announce something about you and perhaps your design philosophy. We're going to repurpose these historical specimens and we're going to deploy them in ways that are poetic or unexpected or maybe just fun um, to generate new messages about your ideas around design. So what's design? Who can be a designer? Who are you as a visual communicator? And I would argue that no matter who you are or why you're here, you are a visual communicator. Even if you're not a professional designer, you communicate visually. Um, or maybe messages about how design should work in the world. Um, feel free to follow me on Instagram. I'm at Dr. Two underscores Dory. 
Um, and I really enjoy seeing your work and hearing from you in a social media context. At the end of our work session, um, I will let you know how to give me permission to share your work on my Instagram channel if you would like to do that. So I am going to show you a couple of things about Miro before I put a link in the chat. So Miro is a collaborative online whiteboard tool. I have set up this somewhat large document that's full of beautiful vintage typographic material. And over here in the upper left-hand corner, these are letter-sized pages that have yet more vintage typographic material. So if you can't find something to be inspired by here, well, I think that's probably just a little bit sad because this is so much beautiful typography. So what we're going to do with this typography is that over here on the right, everybody has a broad side of their own. What I'm going to ask you to do is to choose a broad side and add your name to it show you how to do that in just one moment. And then on your broad side, once you've claimed it as yours, you're going to start cutting and pasting from these selections. So if you highlight some selection that's really speaking to you, You can command C to copy, or you can use your little drop down menu to copy if you're not a keyboard shortcut kind of person. So command C to copy. And then once you're in your own page, you've got a little zoom tool here. You'll also notice that everybody has their own number. Once you're inside your page, you can command V to paste, or again, use your little drop down menu. Um, I lie. They don't want us to paste with our drop down menu. Command V is your friend. Once you've got your, um, your selected typography in your frame, you can also double click on it. Once you double click, you'll get the option to mask your typography. And that's helpful if you only want to use one word, right? So you can crop in to this beautiful word useful with that lovely F, although the letter spacing is maybe bothering me a little bit, but we won't pause there. Um, and you can, when you have your element highlighted, you can drag it around. You'll also notice that when it's highlighted, you can rotate it. These are not transparent images because printing on a letterpress would have meant that was not really a possibility for composition. So we're kind of forcing some letterpress friendly compositions here. Um, by being unable to, to layer things transparently. Also, when you have your typographic information selected, you can scale up or down. And so you really have a lot of flexibility inside this format. To add your name, which is going to be step one, you can use your text tool here on the left add a little text frame. I would suggest making sure that you have a nice large point size, although 144 is probably a bit too large, maybe 48 is good, so that from a distance people can see you have claimed your space. All right, I am going to put our link in the chat.
And then you are going to be able to join us on the Miro board. Once a few people are here, there's one more thing it's going to be helpful for you to know. And Lynn has asked a question about the subconscious versus the conscious. And I feel like this is an excellent question. And the answer is, it kind of depends on how you want to approach this. Um, I don't really have any limitations other than I hope we all have fun. You'll notice that we can see um, some cursors, right, as people add their names to a frame, which is step one. You can decide that you want to show or hide these cursors with this little cursor icon here, because perhaps all of these scrolling, visiting visionaries um, will distract you. So you can hide our collaborator cursors. And then that way, if, if you need to, you can focus a little bit more clearly. So before we get started composing your broadsides, I'm going to ask you to do a little exercise, which is to look through the type for about three minutes. I'm about to turn on some music so it's not weirdly silent. Look through this type for about three minutes. Choose one example of a typeface that says something about your personality. So you don't really care what the word means. You care what the typeface looks like. I think I am going to choose this little sample because this too really resonates with me. It has some curvy bits and I have some curvy bits and it's very solid. And to me, it feels like it's a numeral with opinions that's taking up space in the world. And that's resonating with me. Um, so questions about the mobile. There is an app Sadly, it might remain a little bit buggy on mobile, Marisol. However, there is a free app. So I am going to command C, copy. I'm going to zoom out a little bit so I don't get distracted now that I've chosen my typography. I'm going to go over here to my own frame. I'm going to zoom back in a little bit. Here's my example. Um, I'm going to command V to paste. Oops, it's very big. I have not ruined anything. I'm just going to grab its corner and make it smaller, right? So everyone can experiment with putting their, their word that's set in a typeface that says something about you. And we'll check back in with each other in about two minutes.
ourselves to each other in a moment. I'm seeing some lovely script faces going on here. Some very opinionated sans serifs happening. Some beautiful serifs going on. A couple of people seem to be really into these typographic ornaments. So what's going to happen is that Shannon is about to send us into breakout rooms with maybe four or five people in them. And you're going to introduce yourself to your new best friends, right? Um, and you're going to share your name and where you are joining from. And then also what your typeface says about you. So it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the words of your typeface. It has to do with what your typeface looks like. It's visual voice and how that matches up with something you want to share in this space about your personality. So Shannon, are you are you ready to send us? We're ready to go. I'll send you shortly. Okay. Don't forget your canvas has a number so you can tell people where to find you. So folks are making their way back and we'll all be back together in about 27 seconds, Zoom tells me as an estimate. I'm admiring the wall behind Tori, Tori Doles. Um, yeah. Um, while we wait for our breakout rooms to close, would it weird you out to turn your volume on and tell us what we're looking at? Oh, my God, I would love to. So um, I'm actually in the graphic design room at UCF. And yay! posters uh, are from Native, if I'm not incorrect, <laughs> actually. You, OK, yeah, they're from Native, which is a screen print studio here in Orlando. They're about 20-ish minutes away, I believe, about 20 minutes. Um, some of them are graduate works. Some of them are um, 
current students, some of them are like just gig posters they've made, various projects they've had like over the years and all that. Um, we have a good relationship with Native. A lot of like students go there. We always like kind of cycle through. We actually have a student who works there now. I'm like, say they're not there. It, so um, <laughs> it's too late now as of today yeah yeah i was like oh well it's out there but um yeah so we just it adds a little bit of pop dare i say to our little room so yeah good well touch. yeah way to represent go yeah. local print shops that's awesome thank you for sharing that with us tori okay it looks like we got everybody back i am going to share my screen for a moment just one more time make sure i'm sharing the correct screen okay so you've introduced yourself using your typeface um i would love to have your permission to share what you make on my instagram and be like look at this awesome stuff that all of these people i met the other night made if you are willing to let me do that, what I would like you to do is to move your name now that everybody's like got their workspace going on, move your name off your workspace and add um, your Instagram handle if that's info you want me to tag and just kind of leave it as a little caption. If you don't do that, I'll just assume you're not into sharing stuff on Instagram. But if you do leave your name and if you would like to your Instagram handle, um, that's you giving me permission to share your beautiful work on Insta. Okay, it looks like everybody's got the hang of, of using Miro to do the thing. Um, and I would like to encourage you to just dig in and start experimenting with making your visual design manifesto using these vintage typographic materials to send a message that's of this moment and that is about you. So I am going to turn the music back on. We're going to check in with each other in about 15 minutes and see where we are. Usually at the 15 minute mark, um, folks want a few more minutes to wrap up, but we will check in with each other in about 15. Feel free to drop questions in the chat. Also feel free to just turn on your microphone and say, hey, I've got a question. Um, this is a very informal space. And we've got lots of folks here ready to help out. Okay, so that we don't have technical difficulties this time, I am going to share the music and I'm going to set my personal timer for 15 minutes. And we are going to get started making your visual manifestos. So dig in, y'all. Right, Shannon or Ashley, have we achieved relaxing music? Fabulous. Holler if you need advice or help, or just drop a note in the chat, y'all. Is there an option to flip an image like vertically or horizontally? To reflect it? Uh, yes. Um, give me 20 seconds. All right.
question is no. Um, alas. All right, that's okay. Thank you.
out to go off. A nice little chirping bird to wrap us up there. Shannon, in just a moment, is going to send us to breakout rooms to share what we've been making with each other. Um, but before she does that, I want to share with you how you can save your work if you don't already know how to do that. So I am going to one last time pull up my browser window for us. So you've been working on your beautiful composition. This one is mine. And when I highlight and hover over, I get my three little more dots. Um, and I can then um, save this. I think I've added so many frames that now it's angry at us and it doesn't want us to save them. No, I'm in my wrong three little dots. Okay, so you've got your canvas number. I've named my Dory's example, but maybe your frame 17,000. And then once you're here, you can... Save as image. I swear to you, it did this for me five minutes ago. Export as image. There we go. So um, I think probably it's going to lock you out of vector exporting, um, but you can export your frame as a JPEG. And now you have it saved to your local computer. So your screen, your three little dots, export as image. All right. Now that you have those to save for as long as you would like, um, Shannon is going to send you back to your room with your buddies. And if you would like to share what you've been working on, I'm sure your buddies would like to see what you've been doing. Maybe about five-ish minutes again, Shannon. Sounds All great. Right. See you in five. So as folks are popping back in, uh, we were sitting out here just admiring your beautiful work. These are amazing. I hope you had a chance to share them with your small group buddies. We are big fans of all of your work. There are so many great things happening. And what I love most about them is that they are all so different from each other. And I can almost hear individual voices speaking to us. Um, through the way that you're recombining these materials to share what's important to you. And I know some of you, so I know a bit about the context, and I've never met some of you, so I know nothing about the context, but each one of them has a very distinctive voice and distinctive message. And I hope you had as much fun making them as we're having looking at them. So thanks for joining in. Um, yeah, Hannah has added some links in the chat, especially for the virtual gallery. Um, the show is absolutely amazing. And I think the artists um, that Ashley has collaborated with to bring into the gallery space just speak so beautifully and urgently to our present moment. And their voices are worth hearing. So I hope, I hope you are hearing from them. Allison has a question about gallery hours. We're open Monday through Friday from 10 to 5, um, with exception when we do like the opening reception event, which was actually last week. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, get in touch on Instagram. I'd love to follow you back. Have a great weekend. Thank Thanks you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank mm -hmm. you.